Canadian Prepper here. So today we're going to be talking about the movie Greenland. Is it worth your time? Is there prepper lessons to be learned? Let's talk about it. So before we talk about the movie, I want to talk about this sweater I'm wearing. Everybody's always asking me, where did you get that sweater? Well, I got it off Amazon a couple years ago. It was a random purchase. Didn't expect much out of it, but it's held up surprisingly well. It's made of some cotton polyester thing made in the wonderful land of you know where. And surprisingly, I made that video, maybe not so surprisingly, about the tactical versus gray man, where I was trying to show everybody the benefits of being the gray man and blending in and not trying to be a tactical badass. Unfortunately, everybody went and bought the tactical backpack and everybody wanted to know where I got this sweater. So I'll post a link to it in the description, just in case you want to know. Okay, so Greenland, what is this movie about? Well, it's about an asteroid, not an asteroid, a comet, because I know there's some astronomers out there. It's about a comet that hits the planet and everybody dies. Well, a lot of people die anyways. Spoiler alert. You should probably not be watching videos like this anyways. You should know there's going to be spoilers, okay? Look, if you've seen the movie 2012, you know how this movie is going to end. This is basically the 2012 script, but done in a less comedic way. Why is this movie important? Well, it's important for a couple reasons. It's important because it brings the question into play, and I did a poll about this. I'll post it somewhere. Uh, what would the government do in a situation like this? Now, I've long since speculated, and I've made many videos on this topic before, that chances are the government's never going to tell you when the shit is hitting the fan, and when they do tell you that the shit is hitting the fan, then sometimes there's ulterior motives or slights of hand at play, or they're just maybe minimizing or maximizing. They're never really on the mark, it seems, ever. They're always either overshooting or undershooting. So if they're saying that everything is okay, as the saying goes with John Cusack in uh, 2012, when the government says everything's okay, that's when you run. And there's a reason for that. The reason why they do that is to minimize the amount of human suffering. Because if you knew there was an asteroid coming one year from now, would you tell people that was going to be a extinction level event so they had one year to riot and run rampant and all sorts of crime, the breakdown of law and order, and our last days would be just be spent in misery. Now, the interesting thing about this movie is that it tried to depict things in another light. What this movie sought to highlight was that while there was a lot of chaos and calamity, while there were gangs and a lot of insidious, self-interested people out there, there was still good-natured people, which just slightly edged out the bad guys. Isn't that the case throughout all of human history? Is the good guys just slightly out-edge the bad guys? That's why we have civilization? Anyways, so it's trying to highlight the better parts of human nature, because oftentimes in these movies, we always see every man for himself. Now, the first part of this movie, I found it to be quite riveting. I wouldn't say I was on the edge of my seat, but I was very captivated. Because I don't think any movie that's attempted this before has really been able to emotionally capture what it would be like knowing that you only had 48 hours for the world to end. Not many movies were able to really demonstrate the horror of that. And there were a few key points within the first you know, opening sequence, the first 30 minutes or so, the movie was able to really bring you into that feeling that, you know, the world is about to end and everybody's just losing their shit. But one of the more amusing and probably improbable aspects of the opening sequences are these news reports that they're broadcasting on the scene. They're, they seem to be catering to a really dumbed down, gullible population and everybody in the movie, with the exception of course of the main character, uh, is completely tuned out of what's going on. You know, the government's telling them, ah, oh, it's gonna be okay, and you know, just come gather around the TV. We're, we're gonna watch this thing hit in the middle of the ocean. Most of it's gonna dissipate and everything's gonna be fine. And everybody's really gullible, complacent, and naive. So it's not really that plot, 
No, hang on a sec. No, it's very plausible. Never mind. So it's probably basically what we would expect in this sort of situation. So we can imagine that this is how it's likely going to play out. Okay. So you have your main character, who's the guy from the uh, 300 movie. This is Sparta. Blah blah blah. He's got himself a nice trophy wife who appears to be half his age, but I googled it and apparently she's uh, pressing 40, so she ain't no spring chicken herself. You know it's fiction because in the movie they're handling their separation way too well you know I, mean, I think they're trying to get back they're trying to work it out but they're handling it way too well so you know it's bullshit and uh, you know that the main character is not too bright with all the decision he's making because he's driving a dodge ram okay get yourself a tundra and uh, you'll never have any problems especially in the apocalypse the thing that this dodge ram has to endure unbelievable i just i'm not buying it for a second and he happens to just find this succession of dodge rams go figure i wonder if they had any part in sponsoring the movie now in the movie the name of the comet is called clark i'm not sure why they chose that name there's no easter egg there i don't think maybe some reference to lewis and clark and, and charting a new world or something like that new you know charting the new frontier possibly i, I don't know now one of the cool things about this movie was that I think it really depicts how it would realistically go down because oftentimes you hear about, you know, the big impact event. But with this one, it's like a multi-day raining down of meteor or comet pieces of various sizes and they're hitting different parts of the planet and, you know, you got stuff like just falling on houses and everywhere. To me, that seemed a lot more realistic than one impact event the guy goes to the grocery store for his trophy wife who's clearly wearing the pants in that relationship well when she's actually wearing pants now he gets a call from the department of homeland security because he's a structural engineer okay he's a vip he has a skill set that the government knows is going to be required to rebuild society so they send him a private message that they also happen to broadcast on his TV. I guess they just wanted to make sure that he got the message. The message was basically that the government's building really deep bunker somewhere and you've been selected. Now, my only problem with this is that we all know that the government knew long before the ship was going to go down that uh, they're going to have to rally all these people up. So don't you think they would have, you know, gave people a nudge a little bit earlier. Do you really think they're going to wait until the last minute to start doing the lottery? I mean, maybe they have to because otherwise, if it gets leaked too far in advance, then that's going to just mess with all the logistics of getting your VIPs to the places you want to go. So maybe they have to save it to the very last minute. But of course, as you're going to see, that creates a commotion and uh, sends them on a wild goose chase. Now, it turns out him and his giddy little neighbors are all uh, circled around the TV watching this comet hit the ocean, which everybody thought was going to be innocuous. But, of course, it wasn't. And on his TV is broadcast an emergency thing from the Department of Homeland Security saying that him and his family have been selected by the government in order to go to a bunker. Part of this movie, which was very emotionally engaging for me, was when... After the family that was chosen to go to the bunker was trying to, you know, pack up the car and leave the community, some of their neighbors who caught wind that this was happening, you know, approached them and were begging them to take their child. I thought that whoever the actress was in that scene did a really good job because she really communicated the gravity of the situation and the emotion of a mother who has no other choice, knowing that their child is going to die, knowing that, you know, this is their only hope to get out of there and the lengths that you would go to. And, and the other side of that was our main protagonist who felt really sorry for the mother and her child, but knew that if he took her in, that she would likely be turned away once they did get to the air base where they were supposed to be airlifted to this bunker. And of course, the child would be left to themselves to ride out the end of the world, which would be far worse than just spending it with their parents, whether she was going to live or not. I think that was one of the best scenes in the movie because they're in such a predicament where you know they want to help, but they have to make that decision. What is going to be the best decision not just for us but also for the child so they learn that there's going to be a planet killer in 48 hours looting basically immediately starts but at the same time concurrent with that there's still a lot of people following the rules okay 
And it becomes mainstream now that people have been randomly selected. The government has been sending out these text messages to all the VIPs all around the United States, telling them to report to these Air Force bases and that they're going to be taken to a undisclosed location. Everybody catches wind of this and everybody and their dog wants to get on these airplanes. So they all end up, you know, converging on this Air Force base and all hell definitely breaks loose. Now, one of the first problems that they encountered was a traffic jam. Now, I've made this comment before that if you have to evacuate from a city, you don't take the way that's fastest while the grid was up. You need to take the way that is slowest when the grid was up. Think about that for a second. If you take the freeway because it's the fastest way to get somewhere while society is perfectly functioning, that makes perfect sense. But in a gridlock situation, when everybody has the exact same idea and traffic is not moving, no, you want to take the slow route first. You want to avoid the freeways. You want to take the side streets, the residential streets, okay? The back streets, even the back alleys, even driving on the frickin' train tracks so long as you don't pop a tire. If you haven't watched my video about evacuating from the cities, I would strongly recommend you go and check that out because I think there might be some useful tips in there for you. Now, a huge operational security mistake the character makes is when they're approaching this Air Force base, they come across this huge crowd of people who are trying to basically push past the barricades to get into the planes. And most of them don't have bracelets. Most of them haven't been chosen. So this guy starts screaming out in a, in a crowd of angry people that we were selected. We're selected. And he starts like, you know, showing his phone in the air because they have a QR code they have to scan or something. Don't do that. I mean, I was just, I was waiting for somebody to grab the guy's phone and tackle them to the ground. Fortunately, that didn't happen, but always make sure that you have a smartphone charger in one of these situations, because if that guy's smartphone wasn't fully charged, he would not have been able to have his QR code scanned and his family would have been SOL, even though they pretty much were already. Now, another thing they depicted in this movie was that the military were there doing their duty and a lot of them knew that they weren't gonna be selected. This is an important thing to think about. Don't you think there would be a lot of people going AWOL in a situation like this? If you know you had two days left and you have kids at home in particular, a lot of these soldiers, they got kids, they got family, they got moms, dads, uncles, aunts. Wouldn't you want to spend it with them, you know, instead of ensuring that the VIPs got to their bunkers? It would take a very resolute and stoic individual to stay at their post in a situation like that and forego an opportunity to spend their final hours with their children. So in the movie they depict it as, and they openly talk about this, how all the military are there voluntarily. They know that they're not gonna get a spot in the bunker. They're just doing it out of the goodness of their heart. And maybe, but I'm leaning towards, I don't think it's gonna go down like that. I think military and rightly so, are likely gonna to wanna to spend that time with their families. Now, there's gonna be those people who are, like I said, very resolute, very committed to their job, but it's not gonna be the majority. Okay, another mistake that one of the characters makes is that the mom and kid are traveling their way through this war-torn city, okay? Now, ladies, if a situation like this were to break out, the goal is to make yourself less appealing to predators, okay? And to do that, you don't look like you're gonna go to the club. You ruffle up your hair, you put on a hoodie, you wear some baggy pants. Now in the movie, as with a lot of movies of this sort, the main protagonist, the main family, who's usually some yuppie urbanites, they are not armed. So they're not packing heat at all throughout the entire movie up until the end, when old man from the country, the dad of the, the wife, he gives the, the guy a gun, which he never actually has to use. You're never really put in a situation where the protagonist has to use lethal force, except once he does, but not with a firearm. There's one time where he has to uh, basically take somebody else's life. And they really make a spectacle of that. And they show how he emotionally is struggling with it 
afterwards. It's not just like, okay, he took somebody's life, it's the end of the world, and that's the way it is now, like The Walking Dead. Okay, he really has to go through a mental and emotional process, which I think is quite accurate, because we're so used to these movies where the really humanized good guy just destroys all the dehumanized bad guys who have no name, they're all faceless, and this movie does it differently. It shows that there is a moral and ethical struggle thereafter, that your conscience does eat away at you for most people. It's not in our nature to take life. There was a book that was written on that called On Killing, which I strongly would encourage you to read. It's a very interesting book. In the movie, people are still relying on cell phones, and the wife and the husband in particular, they get split up. They were likely still in walkie-talkie range. So this is why it's important to have a set of off-grid comms that can at least take you out a couple miles if possible. And uh, that's going to help you communicate if there's a grid down situation. Because if the cell towers are down, you're pretty much SOL as a result of this. Another dilemma which comes up in the movie is the fact that this kid is diabetic. Many people who have chronic illness are going to be confronted with the reality that the life-sustaining medication you need, if you don't have it stockpiled in advance, is probably not going to be there. You need to have an ample supply of that, enough to carry you through. Now, in some instances, if shop doesn't reopen again, and if society doesn't bounce back, and if there's no help from the government or the military, then unfortunately, a lot of people who are dependent on these medications, they may not make it out 100%. In an, an effort to try to extend your life and minimize suffering to the best extent possible, try to uh, maximize your stockpiles. Now, throughout all of this, society still appears to be functioning quite well, all things considering. You know, buses are still running, like, you know, people are still uh, going to work, like the woman catches a military bus to some small town, so people are still willing to help each other out. So it's not all doom and gloom in this movie, which I found to be quite surprising because I think most of us would think that, you know, it would be a pretty rapid dismantling and unraveling of the fabric of society. But uh, this movie doesn't depict it like that. So, you know, I mean, I did a poll about that also and I asked you guys, you know, what you thought would happen and most people thought it would go to shit. But even a surprising amount of people in that poll thought, well, you know, there's probably still going to be a good chunk of the population that's going to be trying to help people out. After they get to the dad's house, who's like, uh, you know, no country for old men, lives in the back country, has a gun, blah, blah, blah. After they bounce from his place and they're, they're going to try to go to Canada so they can get a flight to Greenland or whatever, they decide to jump in another Dodge Ram. Yeah, I think it was a dually. So it must have had a very large fuel reservoir because they had to drive this thing a thousand miles it's probably possible but more reason again make sure you got a lot of gas in the tank then of course they fly this really cessna like plane to greenland it's always some kind of plane like that right eventually they get into the bunker and you know they come out afterwards and they can hear the birds chirping and you know it, it is what it is right so the first part of the movie I thought was pretty decent. I think to date between this movie and a movie called These Final Hours, those two movies are the best asteroid impact movies of this sort. I think that These Final Hours was a bit scarier in a sense and a bit more gritty and raw. And I think some people, you know, if you like the movie The Road, you might like that movie, These Final Hours, a bit more. It shows a lot of the darker sides of human nature that are not depicted in this movie. So if you want to see the dark side of human nature, watch These Final Hours. If you want to see the uplifting side of human nature, watch the movie Greenland. Now there is the question of if something like this were to happen, could they dig deep enough? And I think they absolutely could dig deep enough. Would it be very habitable down there? And, and how might it play out in the bunker? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure the government could dig deep enough. So people who say that, you know, there's no chance of survival, the government can survive. Now I'm gonna put my tinfoil hat on here for a second, but I've long since suspected 
that a lot of the declassified military bases actually have tunnels which probably go miles away from the access point in any direction. You, you never know which direction it's going to be underground. Because if you think about it, even if the enemy knew where the entry point was to say like Cheyenne Mountain or something like that, even if they nuked the hell out of that, if there were tunnels that, you know, went miles in one direction, you would never know because it'd be underground, right? I'm pretty sure that somebody somewhere is well aware and prepared for something like this to happen. And let's face it, I want the species to continue even if I can't continue. So even if that means I don't get a seat, I would still hope that somebody would live to carry on the torch of the human race. Even if it wasn't me, even if it was just some spoiled Richie Rich, at least they're going to carry the torch of humanity. I may not like it, I may resist it, but what are you going to do? Let me know what you guys thought about this movie in the comment section below. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com. Your one-stop shop for premium, high-quality, brand-name products that have been tried and tested by myself and other YouTube gear reviewers. My subscribers save 10% off by using the coupon code SURVIVALPREPPER. All one word in all caps.